Hello there. Welcome to this week's episode of the Data Radio Show, where I'm going to be chatting to James Hartwright. Now, James is somebody who I really enjoy talking to because he brings to every conversation just this amazing sense of energy. And when you sit down and chat to him, you realize there's a reason why he wears so many hats. Figuratively, he's not literally wearing a lot of hats. He actually runs a couple of different organizations and has a couple of different roles that he's able to do from his work throughout the years within the data management industry. But he started off his career with a job in the classified ads that his mum pointed out to him. And he's self-taught pretty much the whole way that he's gone along to a point where he's now working with some of the largest organizations in Australia to make sure that their data management practices are fit for purpose. It's a really cool story, but it has a core of making sure that you're able to adapt and change to whatever it is that the industry throws at you. And we've had a lot thrown at us over the last, well, even over the last few years, but the last 25 to 30 years, it's been exponential. So I hope everybody, whether or not you're just starting out in your career and looking for some advice, or you've been in the career for a while and looking at a way of recharging your batteries, get something out of this interview, because I think you're really going to enjoy it. So yeah, let's jump over, catch up with James. Um, joining me once again, I have the managing partner from Pragmaticians, James Hartwright. How are you going today, James? Good, good. Happy Friday. Yeah, happy Friday. Thank God, it's been such a long week here. Um, what is the weather yeah. like there for you at the moment? Uh, it's getting warmer. Um, thankfully, winter's coming to an end. So yes, we've had a very cold year. Um, so, but yes, uh, nice and bright today. Nice. I'm a little jealous. We're cloudy and overcast and it's about 12 degrees outside and I don't like it. Oh, it's okay. I nice summer. Summer, that. summer was fantastic. <laughs> um, tell me what's been keeping you busy lately. Uh, so I've been doing, um, a good amount across, um, a couple of places. So I do chief data officer work, um, as a virtual CDO, um, uh, for a, a state government department. So we've been really busy putting in a new CRM and a new um, insights driven uh, website to to help um, businesses um, in Tasmania get more information about what's going on. Um, and then uh, I'm CTO in a startup. So we are just about to deploy with, to one of our biggest clients, one of the largest companies in Australia, uh, which has also been interesting and exciting. Uh, and finally, I've just gone through um, the second stage of ISO 27001 certification, which is all about security management processes, uh, which has been new for me, quite new in really getting into security of systems. But um, yeah, nicely reusing some of the stuff that I know around privacy and security around data. So yes, busy. <laughs> that, that actually raises a, one of my first questions in a really interesting way. Um, where you are now in your career, how has that changed to what it was like when you first started? <laughs> Eons ago when yeah. I first started. I, I wasn't going to um, mention time. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I can take it. I can take it. Um, yeah, look, the um, I know, as, we, as we all do when, well, generally, as we all do when we get more mature and more senior, more of the conversations that I am having are with senior people, C-level, um, heads of, that sort of thing. Um, and so my um, my interactions have to change. I've had to sort of um, remove my introvertedness and uh, bring more of that um, show-offness, uh, if that's a word, um, it to be. it. Um, <laughs> but, still, but still definitively uh, in the data tells a story and that, you know, the, the data, data as with everything in this life is never perfect. But what I'm doing, it. what I do is to go, this is based on what we see, the data is showing, and therefore the sort of things that I believe you should be doing. It's still your decision, mm -hmm. <laughs> but here are all the stats and the things, and given my 30 odd years worth of experience, where I think you should be going. Uh, whereas when I started, I, it was um, initially, hey, here's a set of things, a set of reports, a set of screens you need to build, go off and build them, um, and then come back and I'll tell you whether I thought they were correct or not. And lots of stuff in between. Lots of stuff in between. Um, when you're dealing with young people who might be new to the industry or looking at getting into the industry, do they have, what's the sort of views that they bring or the, the sort of expectations that they bring to those conversations about how the industry works? And how far is that yeah. from reality? 
Um, yeah. So, so there's a there's a couple of pieces there in industry. So the the um, the things that I found in the if you're talking about the technology part, um, uh, happily, <laughs> they don't have to do what I did when I started write assembly code or and um, re, you know uh, fully construct everything. So writing ETL code from scratch. Um, there's tons more tooling there that is enabling and automating and with LLM, um, even generating new code um, that I, you know, I could have never have thought of doing uh, when I first started development. Um, so from that perspective, their expectations coming in are that <clears throat> I can take, take data from a source system, just create linkage, flows, checks, metrics, bits of data quality, all are all sort of inbuilt. And, you know, I, I can get speed, um, agility from that, which is mainly true, which, which we may come back to in a bit. The second part, that business part, I've look, I've, I've said every person that I've worked with mentored and they're getting the age difference, getting greater and greater. Uh, one guy last, last month described me as his cool uncle, which, <laughs> which I said, he's 25 and I went, yeah, okay, I can take that. Um, but in that business context, just get to know what the business does. Yeah. Don't, you know, you can sit there and just move data from left to right. But if you really get to know what the business is doing, you can start to understand the nuances of the, the way the data into the connects, the way that data is used or misused to downstream and actually make your work better on that basis. Looking at the path that you've taken to get to where you are now, what would you change along the way, knowing where things are at with the industry? Um, all right, one thing I would probably change is, um, not be, um, not be so afraid or nervous about taking on new stuff. Um, there was a job, uh, that I was offered a contract job for six months that I was offered that was something like nine times my salary at the time. And I just went, I don't think I'm good enough, senior enough for that. And then I met, I was presenting at a conference a year later and I met the guy who got that job. And he was going, that was really good. How did you do that? And so that just went, okay, yeah. Go if you feel that you're good at something and you know and you're you know, you know that you've got some of those pieces, um, just go for it. Go and do it. Because um <laughs> with with a you know, especially with that background, that there's so much data available, so much gen AI stuff, Googleable stuff that you can do and get past, you know, below the swimming, below the surface. Um that will get you through and, and just, you know, go with, go with, go in with confidence. Um, uh, it'll, it'll take a bit more time <laughs> behind the scenes, some late nights, but just go and grab any new opportunity that you can. And I, look, that's, that's generally, um, you, what the sort of thing you should be doing. You never, never regret the things that you, that you did. You regret the things that you didn't do. Um, more specifically in business today, um look we 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 we're, we're always going through hard times that uh, that piece of llm coming through um uh and the connected piece on self serve you know that that as i said that traditional stuff that i was doing about physically creating code it's gone and it, it's never going to come back there are specific bits though where you've got system a and system b and system c and they all move data in around themselves and then somebody from the business needs to go, hey, I need to know what, you know, the average timeline between something getting from A to C and where they drop off. You now have to integrate that data. And you're doing that on the basis of what a business person has asked you for. So A, you need to know really the thing behind that question. And then how you how you connect all those sources together. So you're going to create business rules at some place within the data repository. And you need to be able to describe those. They need to be um, checked. So you need your data quality processes, et cetera. That's the bit for me that's always been really interesting. So we've removed all the dross and easy stuff, the bit of generating business rules according to something that somebody's asked and being able to prove it and find the gaps <clears throat> and understand the gaps. That's a real solid, valuable piece of um, capability in your toolkit that um, will provide great stuff for the business. Uh, are there other skills as well that you think people should be bringing into their, their sort of career in this or starting their way through this? Yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll 
start sort of at the top. So um, statistical knowledge. So you're processing data. Just apply that. Does that feel right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've got there's Australia has a population of 25 million people. I seem to have 15 million people in my database, but that means I've got most of the children as well. Does that feel right? No, it doesn't feel right. Therefore, go back and check. Um, and the second part of that is a little bit uh, aligned in the critical thinking. You know, does does gut feel? Does you, does this feel right as you're going through this? So if I'm providing something out, is that actually making sense? Um, and then a bit more into the detail. So um, so there's two pieces in there. So which which so the first one is not. <laughs> not something that many people are doing now and I uh, but I'm seeing highlights of it coming back data modeling mm -hmm. so so modeling the data and separating the data and going here is an entity that makes again makes sense for the business and that is connected to this owner entity in these ways that I know but there're probably going to be five other ways I don't know so understand data modeling and taking all of that raw data in and orientating it slightly or heavily uh, there's also a piece there of understand data modeling Follow the rules before you start breaking them and know why you're breaking them when you do break them. Um, that This for me, I don't care about the LLM's ability to do it. If you provide it better information, if you've segregated these things out sensibly to the business, it's going to do a better job. It's not going to, it's going to hallucinate way less. So still do that data modeling piece. The second part is within that and the world we are in, Privacy. So what you do with depersonalization, segregation, applying ethical principles to that data, because with self-serve, with algorithms on top, you don't really know what's going to, how that data is going to be used. So if you've properly applied segregation and, you know, uh, not just um, uh, done a hash or an encryption of, of um, names, addresses, driver's license numbers, but actually draw the metadata out for them, Put that really personal, unsensitive data over to one side. Use the metadata. Use the codified data. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to truly depersonalize. But if at least if you've thought about it in that data modeling piece and got it, you're some of the way there. And part of the reason for that is privacy acts around the world are going quite rightly. You need as an organization to look after individuals and businesses' personal and sensitive data. Um, and if you've set up a data warehouse that's recording everything in history and somebody says no i'm no longer a customer of yours please forget all of my personal information and it's highly <laughs> connected through your uh your um, data repository and through all of the backups and the history you're, you're you've immediately broken so a bit of initial design in that data modeling the privacy piece so that you know your your system your solution is just going to survive has much more of a chance of surviving. We're actually looking at upgrading our privacy laws here to br basically bring it in line with, with what you've got in Australia at the moment and, and sort of get it up to standard yep. with, with GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, but the yep. government is also looking at bringing on board its own LLM for government departments. And for mm -hmm. me, that just rings so many bells as being a... There's a lot of red flags there, a, a, a lot of red flags yeah. there. Um, but a lot yeah. of the, the younger people who are in the industry here who are really keen to sort of get involved in data management in general see it as a really big opportunity. I, I'm kind of curious, mm. do, is, is that a, a young people know better thing or, or new technology and they're adapting to it? Or is this, is, is this that they're not, um, not wise enough or experienced enough yet to know just how big an issue that could be? Uh, it's it's a bit of both. Um, so yes, as that today, and the the government organisation I'm working with in Tasmania, we we we've got basically a hard stop on anything external coming in and running LLMs over. And that's that like part of the reason for that is um, no organisation has properly privacy privacy separated criticality data classified all of their data, um, and. Um, even if they have, even if they've gone, hey, this is the only set of data that I, I'm sort of approving to go out into public, which is, that's probably the, the piece. <laughs> so 
almost all government bodies know the information and and um, appropriately process the information they release to public. Anything past that that's internal or restricted or top secret um, is rightly put. But even in that public information, um, that thing of self-serve, so you're putting out that public information, which is um, somewhat restricted in content. It has been um, reviewed and approved, but you that LLM needs to know all of the sorts of contextual pieces in which questions can be can be asked. So it's never going to be perfect. Um, you could say that if you're phoning up a call center and asking them, it's also never going to be perfect. But at least there's a there's a human in the loop doing some of those pieces. So today, yeah, still nervousness around hallucination and contextual and forming and framing it. But what what are we? Um, we're five years into LLMs and a year and a bit into when LLMs <laughs> first really became, oh, everybody's using it. Go two, three, five years and think what we what we'll have been able to do with that. You know, there are there are already a number of things in the in the algorithm build flow in model ops, ML ops, uh, where you ask the LLM to generate something and then you ask another LLM to check that LLM's work. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we've already made, we've already made some advances in there in, in going, just go back and take that contextual thing and go, does that actually make sense? Um, so getting the LLMs to do that critical thinking level, again, it's never going to be perfect, but we're putting layers on layers that reduce and reduce and reduce, whereby actually this now becomes really valuable. Um, so from, from a government, um, looking for, um, going to citizens and asking in, yeah, um, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm really confident that we're going to do some great stuff, be able to do some great stuff with that. Um, I think, however, the other part there of applying that internally in all of that data that we have and all of this unstructured and semi-structured data that we've got, I think there's some real power in there and, you know, the traditional structured data and coming from sensors and getting transactions of products that have been bought through that day and by whom uh, much of that unstructured and semi-structured data or the, the unsaid <laughs> parts I think have got just as much um, that for me I've, I've still not in my mind solved how we're going to get that same level of data modeling and understanding from it but but again, but it's it's back to that thing. There, we're going to do business rules. We are going to go in and look at as we've already done things like um, texts and chats and uh, tweets or X's, whatever they are now. Um, that uh, very quickly we started applying sentiment analysis to that data. So we said, hey, what's the sentiment of this overall text? Positive, negative, neutral. Um, and I'd, I'll just go back. When I first started looking at it, we applied that to Australian um, tweets and Australians came out as really negative. Um, I went, oh, that doesn't, uh, so no, no, that's not right. And what it turned out to be was it's been trained on the US who at that point were really, don't use swear words, <laughs> don't, 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 no blasphemy or nothing. And Australians will do that <laughs> all over the place. So they were coming out as really negative. Um, so the algorithm that you apply <laughs> has to tune and tune and improve as well, but, um, come back to that bit. So taking that, taking information out of a, of a text, a tweet, a chat, then pulling out keywords and topics and, and aligning them. So you, you go, Hey, how are we doing as a business based on consumer feedback? Um, let's ignore NPS, but actually let's look at the content. You can do keywords, topics, sentiment. Um, repeated, getting, you know, the stress the, over a number of interactions, are they getting more stressed or less stressed? Are you solving their problem in your call center interaction? Start doing those things and suddenly that unstructured data can really be simply applied and with, with rigor. Um, so, so yeah, I, brand new world. Um, and, and I think we're, we're, you know, the, the, uh, I need a data scientist, I need and somebody who's really strong in algorithms to do this is going to go the way of my old ETL coding is that there are going to be blomp, blomp, blomp. Hey, if you run through these, you're actually going to get something that's a valid output that you can be comfortable in using. If you had advice for young people who are sort of starting today, sort of a, a couple of points that of advice that you would give them, what would that be? Uh I think make well the first thing is make sure that this is the gig for you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but there's <laughs> so looking after data. It's it's a really weird job for me because <laughs> it's really technical in its Ooh. in its base. You've got to you've got to take data from A to B and make sure that it's there and that what you're doing with it is robust and strong. Um, and and under the consideration that somebody somebody's going to it's about like all right um uh i i gave you a car last year for you to be able to get to a to b um and and now i'm saying ah okay tomorrow i need you to get 59 million nine meter electricity poles from a to b and you've got to go at 110 kilometers all the way <laughs> and you go <laughs> i didn't it, i'm not sure that it's set up for that mm -hmm. um so so you've just got to be able to cope with that you've got to be really good at problem solving um <clears throat> but you've also got to be art architecturally sound if you build something that forks off to the left and it's like oh yeah that's that's a future james problem you you're not going to last long so so come in and and yeah get that foundations of what feels right what feels wrong um know that you've got to be in there and problem solve uh the one i've not learned yet learn to say no <laughs> so I know that it feeling. really breaks something if you if you can't do it just go hey i know what you're wanting to try and do but this is basically going to break everything it's going to be unsupportable um i can't guarantee that it's going to get there um uh with you know that you're going to be able to i'm going to be able to support this report ongoing i could give you a one-off and then let's see what we can do with it. But yeah, some of those don't saying those, given the reasoning why, there, there'll be some people who'll do who'll go just do it. And depending on their seniority, you'll have to go, okay. But some of that say no. Is there another way that we can come at this that will give you somewhat the same results that I'm happier to build and support? So yeah, that the that those bits in terms of yeah, if you love problem solving. Uh, <laughs> love problem problem solving, but like also have this thing around repeatability, a product orientation. Mm -hmm. I think data is a good place to be, um, and there's always more of it. <laughs> there's, we're never going to run out of data. No, <laughs> it's just it gets bigger and bigger every year, exponentially. So, um, are there yeah, any sort of yeah. hard skills that you'd recommend people look into, like improve your math skills or writing or? Yeah, I'd, I'd say like like some some basis on st statistics is definitely definitely good. The technology side, ah, it's hard. That's also hard. Um, yeah, that piece I said around data modeling, understand some of the concepts that are out there around um, data meshes, data fabrics. Um, go and look at obviously Data Vault, Kimball, but also go and look at the the ones that I really don't like, like One Big Table, which have a place, but not in not as a core technology for me. <laughs> but just keep your eye out on some of those things. But getting that good grounding in data modeling, um, the technology parts. You are you if you're coming into a job or your second or third job, you are almost definitely going to find and be um, asked to use tools that you've not used before. Um, so you know, going off and learning Databricks or DBT or Snowflake. It's going to be valuable because you're going to get experience, but don't believe that the next job and the job for for Dan, you're going to be using the same thing um, because tools, organizations change over time. Um, I was, as I say, writing 370 assembler and 4GL stuff on the mainframe 30 years ago. Um, even 10 years ago, I was on a traditional data warehouse system that was run on-prem. Um, and now we're almost 100% in cloud. Um, we are using um, uh, databases, lake houses that can take in JSON and XML, where I was always on structured. Also, that same area, I can take in images and PDFs and et cetera, and process those. So yeah, don't uh, keep up to date um, unless you really want to become an SME in a, in a piece of software. Um, just be flexible. <laughs> Is there, a, for you, a preference between something like a formal education in this or a self-taught sort of path for people or see the benefits of both? Uh, <laughs> well, you, you won't use me as, as, uh, as, the, uh, as the necessarily the good way to go. So um, I dropped out um, and uh, my mum found me my first IT job. 
She went, here it is in the paper, in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want trainee developers. So I joined, I got the job, started as a trainee developer um, and worked my way through. Um, I've got other people, um, other friends who've gone through university um, and um, got got that foundational block, you know, that stuff around. So the sort of the timeline, the three years that I did in learning and um, reading and courses the company sent me on and their thing around going to university and getting stronger principles. You know, we both ended up somewhat at the same point. But each person, um, as they enter in, is going to find a different route. Um, yeah, I've got um, some old colleagues did geography degrees. Um, I've got a, a colleague who uh, worked in um, oh, what is he's uh, ah so the word's gone, but he's basically an arborist. So he went and did his Waterfall. degree in arboreal processing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's found applicability because he went okay. Well, we need to do spatial. So spatial analysis, analysis of how trees and plants and et cetera grow. Oh, they're growing over power lines. Well, actually, now there's a real business context to which I'm applying that. But I, to, to apply that, I need to break those pieces of um, images up, do LIDAR, do processes, draw the metadata out from that, put them in a pipeline, and then present them out. So, so yeah, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't really matter where you've come from, what you think. Put the, bring the curiosity in, bring that desire in and bring some of that, yeah, that foundational stuff, as I said, in the data modeling and um, uh, knowing the business um, and as soon as you can, as quickly as you can um, do it. Have you come across any like really out there careers that people have moved into data from other than horticulture? Like, I mean, that, that's a bit of a jump. You wouldn't expect somebody who, who has, you know, that no, background no. going into a field like data management. Uh, well, well, there's me. I was a van driver before I became, or I came yeah. a developer. Um, yeah. Um, look, the the um, it's getting less and less. Most most people who I now work with have come up through in some sort of computer science style degree. Computer science plus something else. Computer science plus finance. Computer science um, plus education. Um, there are yeah fewer of them who've come through that i just you know spent nights and weekends playing around and writing code and seeing what i could do there's there's less of that um but that's possibly the arenas that i'm i'm in um yeah i i can't think of anything much more left field than the arboreal mm. guy and the the geologist they they were like okay how did you get here yeah yeah it's got to be a fascinating story though that would make them change like that Brilliant. Indeed, yeah. What about mistakes people make? Have you come across many mistakes that people bring to the job or around attitude or outlook? Uh, um, <clears throat> I, look, the the that that bit it, it's um, some of it, like a lot of it's just around that experience piece. So, um, still, the majority of data people I work with are heavily analytically orientated um, and uh, deal with the analytics, deal with the actuals. Um, and um, also to that thing of, hey, the data, oh yeah. And then, sorry, presenting that back to the business and going, hey, here's the, here's the result, but they do it in really technical terms. Here's the result, but they're going, oh yeah, but there's a 1.7% confidence error on this data. And it just yeah. <laughs> meeting of the minds, meeting of the language, and and it is like as I say, it's uh, as I said there, getting to know the business, getting to engage the business. There's a, there's a sort of a line of um, you'll get start getting to talk to more senior people the more you get to work the lingo and convert your technical knowledge and understanding into their speak. But yeah, it's it's those ones where you have to let it happen. <laughs> that you get somebody and they go and present and they go and talk, but they they ha you have to give them that positive feedback that um, of great job. You need to look at your audience and work with them and and go, hey, when I say blah blah blah, confidence level, that means we're still good. <laughs> <laughs> it just you know I'm just covering my ass in terms of it might go off this way, but but um, because I know that it might go off this way, 
I'm putting um, checks in, I'm looking at trends, I'm doing anomaly detection on that, so that if it does start going a bit off that way, rather than the way I predicted, we can react to it at the appropriate time. So yeah, just those sorts of things. Um, look, the, the other one is, is probably just that thing of expecting too much too quickly. Yeah, it took me 10 years to get to a consulting style position. Um, and some people are still going, well, in three years, I want to be a CTO. And I'm, I'm just saying, it's just not going to happen. You might be really lucky. Uh, you might be really great. But in the majority you, that, that you, you, you need to work through some of that piece of, of getting the earning the right to have that role. Um, because if you're a, if you're a CTO or you're a consulting person, um, you need to you need to have some of that level of experience to go in this situation. I could have gone this way, this way, or this way. You can only really get it from experience that there are three different ways. This is the this is the one I'm going to pick and do, and you can only really do that through having a lived experience. Um, so that's the the one is that is like, um, you know, go into it knowing that this is a journey that the end results in both um, having, you know, I, I actually love my job. <laughs> you know, that I've always gone, if 80% of it is really good and 20% of it is the drudge and the, you know, having to do recording, then that's a good job. Mm -hmm. um, if you can get to that level, um, things like money will come along. And if you got something that you enjoy doing and there's a, a great salary that comes along with it, isn't that a happy life? Yeah. <laughs> why would you complain retirement. about that? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's a journey. Things, things aren't going to run at the speed that you really want, but come back to my probably first thing, jump at every opportunity that you can, because that will get you up that pace higher. You will have some real, real hard learning moments and like nervousness and, and et cetera, and late nights. But um, again, if it's something that you enjoy doing, the the outcomes that you get and the, your speed of the learned experience just goes up and up and up. I think that's a fantastic place to end this. That's brilliant advice. So thank you very much, James. It is much appreciated you being here. I always learn so much having a chat to you. So it's always, always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yes, great. To see you. Cheers. Hey, I want to thank you and James for joining me for this week's episode. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe if you're watching the video. I don't know, post it on LinkedIn or MySpace. And if you're listening to the podcast, don't forget to give us a rating and tell people that they should come along and have a listen. It's always really fun to get feedback from people about what it is that they've enjoyed on the episode as well. And I really do hope you got something out of it because I find talking to people like James just absolutely brilliant it's really inspirational and it helps me sit here and go well that that's a really cool thing to do or career path to go down or a really important bit of minutiae that people might have missed when it comes to looking at data management as a whole look until next time have yourself a fantastic week we'll catch you all next time and may the force be with you